Suspense. Tonight, bring you Mr. Henry Daniel as star of The Last Letter of Dr. Bronson, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment to bring you Henry Daniel in a remarkable tale of Suspense. My dear Mosher, forgive me if I dash this letter off rather hurriedly. There are but a very few minutes remaining for me, the few minutes between now and midnight. You've always protested my fascination with the subject of death. It irks you to hear me discuss the latest electrocution or hanging. You alone, Mosher, will know how this fascination has led me to this terrible moment. I should like you to have the facts. First of all, let me recall a conversation which we held here in my study a little over a year ago. You go again, Bronson. Death and murder. Really, you're unhealthy. You're... Please, please, Mosher, just answer my question. Why do men behave as they do? What keeps them from breaking loose? Why don't they kill one another as animals do? Why? Because they aren't animals. But my dear Mosher, being neither vegetable nor mineral, they must be animals. What I mean is... But you don't know the answer. I do. So? I have been studying the question for some time. And I am prepared to prove. In fact, I am going to prove that there are five basic checks which serve to restrain man from murdering his fellow man. Really, Bronson, I... The uh... obvious corollary is that murder occurs only when some stronger drive overrides these five basic checks. You make it sound very simple. It is simple. And what are these five basic checks? A murder is composed of four elements. The murderer, the motive, the opportunity, and the victim. I shall select five men, each of whom I shall predispose to murder, and then restrain from murder by the particular check I am testing on him. Personally, I'd rather play with rattlesnakes. Then, having found my men, I simply supply each with a motive. Greed, revenge, jealousy. I see. And your next step must be to give each man an opportunity. Precisely. And finally, I must supply a victim. You will ask this victim to face five men, each standing to derive satisfaction or profit from murdering him? Correct. His only chance of survival being the correctness of your theory of checks in all five instances? Yes. And do you seriously imagine you will persuade any man to have such utter confidence in your reckoning? There is one such man. Who? Myself. Bronson, this is insane. Why? Why should I hesitate to risk high stakes on a sure thing? But your life... I tell you, there is no danger whatsoever. When will you begin your experiment? I suppose in about... Well... Why wait? Why don't we begin right now? Moshe, I invite you to kill me. What? There's a revolver right here in my desk. You're joking, Bronson. What possible motive would I have for murdering you? Motive? Well, we are known to be associated rather closely in our work. You'll come naturally into my entire practice. I'll put that in writing. Why, it's preposterous. Why? Why don't you kill me then, Moshe? Why, there are dozens of reasons. In the first place, I'd go to the electric chair for it and... Ha <laughs> ha, there you are. A perfect illustration of the first and most obvious check. Man refrains from killing because he himself will be killed by law. The first? What about the last? Ah, that, my dear doctor, remains to be seen. <laughs> Suspense are bringing you Henry Daniel in The Last Letter of Dr. Bronson, a radio play by Richard Craig and Leonard Sinclair. Presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. And now, bring back to our Hollywood sound stage, Mr. Henry Daniel in The Last Letter of Dr. Bronson. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. And so, my dear doctor, 
You yourself illustrated the first of my five positive checks which restrain man from murder. Fear of the law. That was more than a year ago. The remaining checks have not been so simple. I had to locate my four subjects. I had to cultivate the friendship of each so that when the time should come to confront him with my proposition, I should be certain of how he would act. The first of my four potential murderers was a clerk named Totten. Totten was badly in debt. His wife was in the hospital about to undergo an expensive operation. And he was a deeply religious man. We went to church together on Sunday evening at St. Stephen, right around the corner from my apartment. One Sunday evening after the service, I asked him up to my apartment, and as we walked along, we talked. You know, Dr. Bronson, I was talking about you to my wife the other day uh, before they took her to the hospital. I was saying what a great comfort it was to be with you these Sunday nights. Oh, now, come, Mr. Thompson, you embarrass me. No, I mean it. In the world today, too many people seem to feel that they no longer need their God. Yes, their lives are void of the great thing you have in your face. Church is a great comfort to me, and I do need something to cling to in times like these. Totten, you could make rather good use of $5,000, couldn't you? Didn't like you to make fun of my poverty. I am quite sincere. Do you know what even $100 would mean to me? And at present, more than ever. Yes, with your wife's misfortune. Oh, isn't this your apartment that we're passing? I want to go in the sideway. We should be unobserved. Unobserved? You'll understand presently. Please come into my study. Now, if you'll take this chair opposite my desk. Thank you. Totten, you said that even a hundred dollars would be a great help to you. Here in my desk, I have a, this little package containing five thousand dollars. It's yours. What, what could I do for you that would be worth all that money? Let me explain. My doctor called on me yesterday, and he told me, well... To be quite frank with you, Totten, he said that I was slowly going mad. Oh, no, Doctor. That couldn't be. I'm quite all right at present, but it's only a matter of time. And I'd rather not have to face it. I believe you can understand that. But uh, there must be something you can do, uh, knowing in advance. There is. And I want you to help me. I don't understand. Put on these gloves. Take them. But why? As soon as you have them on, I shall hand you this small bottle. Notice, I am clearly impressing my finger, fingerprints on it. Finally, here on the desk, I'm leaving this note explaining that I have committed suicide. Suicide? When the bottle is in your hand, I want you to remove the stopper and empty the contents upon my outstretched tongue. Thus, I will be dead within a few seconds. Then you may leave by the same way we came in. You will be quite unnoticed. And with the $5,000 in your pocket... $5,000? What do you say? You can't die yet. You're not ready. Shall I be any readier when I have gone mad? Of course it's... But you can't take the matter of life and death into your own hands. Precisely. I have certain scruples in the matter. That's why I'm asking you to do this for me. I'm very sorry. I can't oblige you. If it's the law you fear... Oh, no, it's not that. You seem to have arranged that perfectly. Then what is it? I am an honest Christian. I thought you were, Dr. Bronson. If you don't understand why I can't do this monstrous thing, I suggest you look up the Sixth Commandment. Good night. So, Moshe, my second point was proved. Man refrains from killing because it is against his religious principles. The hands of the clock now read 15 minutes to midnight. One quarter of an hour in which to complete this report. My third proposition called for an entirely different sort of man. In fact, the very antithesis of Totten. For a number of nights, I frequented the rougher districts of the city. At first, I had no luck. Then, one night, I came upon my man very unexpectedly. I was walking along one of the darkest streets with no one in view. He was a man 
slumped down beside an ash can. He'd been shot in the chest and left arm, severing an artery. He was bleeding profusely. I tore off his shirt and made a tourniquet for his arm. Oddly, no one came into the alley to investigate. Never mind me. Get away. Was this a gang shooting? What do you think? I think they're going to the hospital. No, no, no. They'll squawk to the cops. Come on. I'll help you to your feet. No. I ain't going. You'll no. die, man, if you're not treated quickly. I ain't going, I tell you. No cops. No cops. No cops. <laughs> His name was Matt Doyle. I visited Doyle in the hospital almost every day. Several months later, I decided to put him to the test. I found Doyle in one of his hangouts and brought him to my apartment. And for the second time, I carefully explained my proposition. Oh, that's the angle, huh? Then you understand. Here are the gloves. Here is the suicide note. And here is a forty-five caliber automatic. You are familiar with this type of weapon, I take it? Familiar? You kidding, bud? Is this on the level or are you nuts? Absolutely on the level. And I am not nuts. Yes. The, wa- the water do is mine if I kill you? That's right. And nobody will know I done it? No one. Well, these gloves is kind of small for me. That's all right. They'll do. Yeah, yeah. You want me to put on the other one? It's safer. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. Doyle, I want you to understand exactly what you're doing. Without any justifiable cause, Merely for the sake of money, you are going to murder me. You understand that? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. You've been hired to do this before. Well, yeah, I suppose it ain't going to hurt to talk about it now that you're going to... But you've never killed a friend, have you? Well, yeah. Yeah, I have. Anyway, they was my pals until they got into the boss's way. But when the boss would say, slip it to him, Matt, well, then it was just another job to me. But you were... Uh... I don't know. What? No, no, I can't do it. But I thought you said... Here, here, take these gloves. Afraid of the law? No, I'm not. What's the matter, then? Is it because I'm your friend? No. It's more than that, it's... uh... It'll be an act of true friendship. No. I can't do it. Look, I'm sorry, Doc. I ain't the guy. Look, you saved my life. So that's it. I'm sorry. I wish you could help me. Yeah, yeah, me too, but not that, Doc. Look, if there's any other person you want me to take care of, that's a... No, 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 there's nothing. Thank you, just the same. There was my third proposition. Man will not kill fellow man if a sufficient degree of gratitude has been invoked. Even a professional killer, one of the lowest examples of human life, such as Doyle, could not bring himself to murder his benefactor. My next subject was altogether different in temperament. With Judith Ainsley, I used a special technique. I first encountered Judith Ainsley when I operated on Barrett Sheffield, the actor. You will recall that Sheffield was brought to the hospital with a lung abscess. As I was preparing to do the rib resection, I noticed that the nurse standing beside me was greatly agitated. Retractors, doctor. Thanks. Doctor, do you think this is advisable? What? What? Please just me as more pronounced. Listen. The veins in another hemisphere, please. But he's getting blue. Doctor, do you think you really should? He's... He's cyanotic. The veins, I'm sorry, doctor, but if anything... Doctor, doctor! Caffeine, quickly. Please! Quickly! Catherine, Here it is. Well, that's that. Yes, that's that. Miss Ainsley, what's the matter with you? You've been acting strangely all through this operation. You killed him. You killed him. You should have never gone ahead. You know that. I warned you. I shall see to it, Miss Ainsley, that you are never assigned to one of my cases again. What's the matter with you anyway? Have you never seen a pulmonary before? Or does it upset you to see a handsome actor like Barrett Sheffield die? Yes. It did. Oh. Yes. We were going to be married next week. If I ever saw hate, cold, undying hate, it was in that girl's eyes. I had made the most implacable enemy of my life. 
I inquired about Miss Ainsley and learned she'd done four years of medical and was now interning at Cedars of Lebanon in the hope of picking up a resident fellowship. I went down to the hospital and waited for her in the doctor's lounge. Presently she came in with another intern. I stood up. She turned and looked at me. I saw again in her eyes that inexorable hate. She had never forgiven me for what she incorrectly felt. It was my error in judgment. I walked towards her. Excuse me, please. I see you remember me, Miss Ainsley. Yes. Will you excuse me, please? Miss Ainsley, you may not believe this, but I have come here especially to talk to you today. To talk to me, Dr. Bronson? Yes. Sit down, won't you? Miss Ainsley. Dr. Ainsley, if you please. Oh, yes, of course. Doctor, I have a little proposition to make to you. First of all, there are two facts I'd like to be sure of. A, you are unable to set up your own practice because you don't have the money to get started. Is that right? I don't see what business that is of yours. It happens to be true. Fine. Fact B, you still hate me and feel a strong desire to be revenged for the wrong which you consider I have done you. Yes, I'm afraid that's true, Dr. Bronson. Good. Good? Yes. You see, I want to pay someone to murder me. So once again, taking this set forth of simple conditions. Well, I'm not sure that you're entirely sane, Doctor. Go on, you interest me. You see, it's my heart. I've had considerable damage. Coronary occlusion. Had to spend six weeks on my back. Just got up last week. Naturally, I was given digitalis. Yes, and... yes, I see, Doctor. You've been heavily digitalized, and if someone were to give you an injection of calcium gluconate, you would have an immediate heart block. Dead within a few minutes. Exactly. A simple error of judgment, unavoidable. Five thousand dollars. My own practice. You'd better be careful, Doctor. You may tempt me a little too far. I thought you'd find it an attractive proposition. It'll only be an error. I will say that I'm feeling badly again, a recurrence of my pericardial pains. I'll go back to bed and ask that you be assigned to take care of me. The rest is simple. No one would ever expect you to know I had been digitalized. Still, if I were on my toes, I would naturally go over your case history before giving medication of any kind. Well, yes. I suppose that's true. Professional people might think you've been a little lax. Might not have the highest regard for a new doctor who launched a career with such an unfortunate, such an unprofessional incident. And just a slight stain on your reputation, but just for a very short while. Oh, yes. You're very clever, doctor. You knew that would do it, didn't you? I want to thank you. You've done me a great service. You mean you'll do it? You've reminded me that nothing, no money, revenge, nothing can be worth the slightest shadow of suspicion in a doctor's career. No. No, they'll never say that I lost my patience because of an error in judgment. You see, I once knew a doctor who did. There, Moshe, is my fourth check. Man, or in this case woman, refrains from killing because of the fear of loss of reputation. <laughs> I come to the testing of my fifth subject. A man who would not murder because he couldn't bear the sight of blood. Much less the responsibility for shedding it. Ladern was my man, and I found him shortly after my search began. On that day, I saw him turn a ghastly white as a fast-moving car ran over a small dog which had run into the street. Ladern clutched his throat and fell in a dead faint. I, of course, made it my business to become acquainted with him. I hadn't seen him for more than four months until tonight. He changed, I noticed, as he took his place at my desk. He's thinner. His dark eyes seem blacker than ever. And so now, for the fifth and last time, I explain the necessary details. And I have arranged everything necessary, Ladder, to give the appearance of suicide. Here is the farewell note which I have written. It will look like suicide. That's right. And here is the knife. It is with this knife that apparently I shall have killed myself. Notice how sharp it is. Notice I am carefully putting my fingerprints on it. You've arranged everything? Everything. No one knows I'm here? No one. You want me to kill you now? I... Yes. Of course, it'll be a bit messy. 
When a person is stabbed, his blood usually spurts out. But if you keep to one side... Why do you want to die? My doctor says I'm going insane and that I haven't got much longer. That's strange. About going mad? About him saying that you're going mad? Yes. It was a shock. I don't mean that. What do you mean? That's the same things they told me. That is... The what? They told me over a year ago that I was going mad. But I just laughed at them. Over a year? Well, do you... Have you you noticed any change? Not much. At least no change for the worse. That's good. In fact, I'm really much better. I've been having fewer and fewer of those six spells. You remember how I was the day that dog was run over. But, Ann, you don't mean you've got over those six spells? I haven't had one in three months. Then there isn't any check. What check? Nothing. Well, this is going to be a pretty messy business. Might as well get it over with. Nice gloves you got here. Nice and smooth on my hand. Then you're going through with it? I've got my gun right here, too. Beauty, isn't it? Yes. Then, if you'll give me back the knife... Oh, no. I'd like to use the knife. I've used this gun a lot the last three months. Killed about 50 dogs. The gun. You done that. It's very interesting. I do it after midnight. You have to know just where to hit them. Kills them instantly. But the noise. Aren't you afraid? Oh. Silencer. See? I don't like to wake people up when I kill their dogs. But they'll find the bullet. They'll trace it to your gun. They're sure to get you. In a suicide, the weapon stays right beside the body where it falls. Who says this is suicide? It's murder. I'm going to murder you. That's what you asked me to do. Look here, Ladern, this has gone far enough. I was only joking. I don't want you to kill me. Yep, 5,000, it's all here. Listen to me, I was only joking. So I do it now? No, wait. You want it through the heart, don't you? Not yet. Can't you wait? Just a little while. What for? Well, I've been conducting a little experiment. I'd like to write an account of it before I go. What sort of an experiment? I don't think you'd understand. Well, I'll wait till midnight, then I gotta go. There's a German police dog, a big ugly brute. But I'll wait. Thanks. Ten minutes past eleven. Yeah. You got fifty minutes. I'll wait by the window. So, Moshe, my experiment has ended. Strange, isn't it? That the one thing I didn't count on was the choosing of a subject who would not respond to my checks, who in fact has no checks at all. For insanity knows no restraint. Dr. Bronson, it's midnight. He's waiting at the window. It's strange. I'm beginning to understand exactly what is going on in his mind. I wonder why. Now, I shall sign my name for the last time and lay down my pen. Then I shall look up and say, All right, Ladern. Suspend. 
Thursday, same time. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear. Suspense is broadcast from coast to coast and to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs> 